and he is 104 years of age when I'm taking him on this. And he's, um, I had been up to visit him in London, Ontario, and I had been um, telling him about my mom's story. And funny enough, my mom's father is also a British home child, which, you know, mom gets into a big twisty story with it. Her dad came over in 1894 with the Dr. Bernardo Holmes, and uh, he married over here in Canada, had five children, and would eventually move back to England, and that's where my mom was born. So that's, you know, and he left the family while they were over there, so that's how you get, get a father and a daughter. But this fella, you know, at the, at the end of the interview, I kind of crouched down when I was telling him about my mom, and. Um, and her story, and then I told him about my grandfather, who was brought by the same organization that brought Walter Golden. And he says to me, he says, oh, well, he says, you must know everything about Bernardo's then. And I said, no, I said, not really. I said, because, you know, my mom wouldn't tell me about it. And at that point, his demeanor just changed, and his face fell. And, uh, you know, he started to sob. And you'll see that, and I had the cameras turned off, but I had my voice recorder still going. So you have to kind of listen to it carefully what he says to me, and I've got the words coming up here. But while he's saying this, this 104-year-old guy has got his head down on my shoulder, sobbing his heart out. It was just, uh, I think it was probably the most defining moment of uh, doing any of this work was, was, you know, tied up into the 60 seconds that it took him to say this to me. We'll get it going. Thank you. 
Almost 40 years before the home child movement began, Robert Chambers, a police magistrate in London, appeared before a government inquiry suggesting that the children who cluttered the streets of that city be gathered up and shipped to Canada. These children, he said, after all, were begging in the streets, sleeping in the gutters, and turning whole neighborhoods into dens of thievery. In 1833, the Children's Friends Society brought the first shipment of children to Canada, but it wasn't until 1869 that the migration of these children began in earnest. From the onset of this migration movement, there was opposition to this in England. We can see this depicted in this cartoon Crookshank created in 1869 as a social comment in direct opposition against Maria Rye's Canadian immigration movement. The lady with the whip near the cart watches as the children are being shoveled in as street garbage, stating, I am greatly obliged to you, Christian ladies and gentlemen, for your help, and as soon as you have filled the cart, I'll drive off and pitch the little dears aboard a ship and take them thousands of miles away from their native land so that they may never see any of their relations again. Most institutionalized children were not true orphans. Indeed, there were a great number that were, as there was a great number of unfit parents. However, from the start, it appears that the vast majority of children housed in institutions of all forms came from parents who turned to these institutions in times of need as a result of illnesses, death, or extreme poverty. In 1869, Maria Rye would bring her first shipment of children to Canada, followed in 1870 by the first shipment of Annie McPherson. Other philanthropists such as Father Nugent, William Quarrier, John Middlemore, Emma Sterling, James Deacon, Dr. Thomas Stevenson, and in 1882, probably the best known of them all, Dr. Thomas Bernardo, also started bringing children to Canada. All children were unaccompanied by their parents. In fact, only a small percentage of the some 120,000 children brought throughout the following years were, in fact, true orphans. Now, the migration of the problem children was not a new idea to England, and if populating Canada was an objective, one wonders why they didn't migrate the entire families instead of just the children, and where this complacency and the separation of poor children from their families was born. It has been often said that we should look back on these times, not with modern eyes, but with the understanding that those times were different. In 1925, a Canadian article entitled The Undertow of Juvenile Immigration was published by author Hazel Bell McGregor. In this article, she said, more and more social workers are realizing that in the adjusting of human lives, they must reckon with this law that has to do with own folks. It is a law as persistent as the law of gravitation, and when ignored, the consequences are equally as disastrous. It is true that there are times when we must work at cross purposes with this law, and then it is an uphill fight every inch of the way. Anyone who has attempted to wean a child from his own family knows how the whole force in nature seems to be working against the process. To remove a child from his own home, in theory, is a hideous thing. But in practice, it is an experience that burns an ugly scar forever on the memory of one who does it. In 1928, Southern Ontario, at the first annual review of the <coughs> Social Workers Club of Toronto, was an unsavory song entitled, Britain Shall Never Be Slave. I think it is important that we read some of the verses of this song. It is clear in Canada that we knew full well what was being done was wrong. Times may have been different in 1863, but by the 1920s, the social attitude towards child migration had changed. There was a London urchin of a feeble-minded strain. His parents both were in the clink and he was raising cane. The poor law guardians got him, but he drove them near insane, till an immigration home got a subsidy for shipping him across the main. His tonsils were defective and his teeth were just a wreck. He had a spot upon his lung and he could not see his back. The government men were busy, so we used our own MD, and we bluffed and examined, got him past, and hustled him across the sea. When he reached this land of promise, with a hundred just the same, we sent him to a farmer, though we hardly knew the farmer's name. He may have been a trifle lowly, for kicks are all he understands, but why supervise when it's far from wise to get him back upon our hands? We've heard this thing called casework in our island of the free, 
But what it has to do with the problem child, we never yet could see. We know a technique far from easy for family breakups cause us small concern. To keep a home together costs real money, but immigration brings a cash return. We've unloaded 80,000 hopefuls on Canada, the loyal and the fair. Australia built a nation on our convict population, so Canada should take her share. They are 99% successful, but we're certainly not going to say why we think it is so, for we very well know facts are stubborn and they point the other way. When we take a look back even further, we find that in 1874, the British government sent Inspector Andrew Doyle to Canada to report on the care and placement of the Ryan McPherson children. His report was highly critical of these schemes and uncovered many faults, including the lack of supervision and follow-up with the children's placements and many cases of abuse and neglect. Mr. Doyle noted that the people themselves responsible for the immigration of the children referred to them as wastes and strays, gutter children, and street Arabs. He also stated that these children were represented in Canada as the offsprings of thieves and vagabonds swept from the slums of Britain's streets, a refuge from their workhouses. He also stated that this unjust characterization of these children was causing them prejudice in their workplaces. Mr. Doyle also reviewed the indentured contracts for the children. Indentured contracts were legally binding agreements signed in exchange for the children's work. In Canadian farm families, children were expected to earn their keep through work, so it was not surprising that the home children would also be expected to work. However, in return for this contribution of work to the household, the children of the farmer were often bequeathed the land in their parents' wills. This inheritance system was not considered an appropriate means of repayment for the home children, therefore the indentured contracts were supposed to be a means of ensuring the home children were repaid for their work. These contracts bound the home children by law until the age of 18, unlike Canadian-born children who were free to make their own choices long before this age. As for their terms of service, Andrew Doyle stated that no Canadian family would accept such terms for their own children. He also stated that the cases in which children were adopted as family members was extremely rare. In June of 1875, the Canadian government addressed the issues raised in the Doyle Report in what would become a one-page rebuttal. They found that the work being done by Ryan McPherson was satisfactory and that in fact it was recommended that the government should continue to financially support their work. Immigration of the children did slow down for a while following the Doyle Report, but mainly because of the bad press it had received in England. By 1882, Dr. Bernardo, who previously brought children through McPherson's organization, began sending children to Canada under his own name. It wasn't too long before parents of some of these children began to protest, either wanting their children returned to them or not wanting their children sent to Canada. In 1885, Dr. Bernardo himself boasted that no fewer than 47 cases brought against him, he had won over parental rights, citing moral rights above the law. However, no cases had made it to the High Court until 1889 with the cases of Harry Gossage, John James Roddy, and Martha Ann Ty. In Martha's case, Dr. Bernardo was committed to prison, guilty of failing to obey a court order to produce Martha when her mother demanded her return. In this judgment, it was said that Dr. Bernardo, in his zeal for his own benevolent objectives, had overlooked the rights of other people and the law of the country. By 1891, the Custody of Children Act, Dr. Bernardo Relief Law, came into effect. A law which made legal the removal of children from parents who were deemed unfit a law which stripped these parents of their parental rights without court intervention, a law which prevented their return after their stay in institutions, and a law which legalized their removal from the country. In the booklet, Immigration Statutes and General Handbook, issued by the Immigrants Information Office, Westminster, April 1892, it states, It has often happened that the immigration or other disposal of a child has been prevented to the injury of the child by the parent claiming its production. The Custody of Children Act 1891 gets rid of this difficulty. Further changes to this act mandated that if an order was granted for a child's return to their parents, 
then that parent could be made to repay the organization who had custody of the child part or all of the costs involved in caring for these children. This law made it highly unlikely that poor parents would seek court action to regain custody as they likely would not be successful, and if so, they would not be able to repay the cost of the child's care. From the proverbial horse's mouth, they got rid of this difficulty and cleared the way to unhampered, legalized migration of children without the consent of their parents. With the inception of these laws, the flood of children brought to Canada seemed unstoppable. In total, over 50 organizations were involved in the migration of these children. Receiving homes popped up from one end of Canada to the next. Prominent officials and citizens from many towns assisted and encouraged these organizations by providing homes to be used as distribution centers for these children. One of these men, Sir George Cox, a very prominent Canadian businessman, a member of the Canadian Parliament, the president of the Midland Railway Company, and also an agent for the Canada Life Assurance Company, donated the home Hazel Bray in Peterborough, rent free to Dr. Bernardo. Sir Charles Tupper, then the Canadian High Commissioner in London, and later the sixth Prime Minister of Canada, worked with the Minister of Agriculture and the Canadian Pacific Railway to help Dr. Bernardo acquire a large industrial farm in Manitoba. There is a misconception, which still lingers today, that these children were scooped from the streets, that there was no other choices for them, and that they likely would have died in the streets if not sent to Canada and given a better chance at life. In some cases, particularly in the early years of these schemes, this is certainly true. However, the vast majority of these children were not orphans as believed, did not come from the gutters, but in fact came from families who turned to these organizations in times of need with the belief that these organizations could provide a better life for their children. Needs arising from things such as illnesses, death, loss of jobs, desertion of a spouse, war, and extreme poverty. Many parents believed that once the family crisis was over and they were back up on their feet, they could retrieve their children only to find out that they had been deported and their whereabouts not revealed to those parents. Organizations such as Bernardo actively promoted the thought that they would provide a better life for your child. And indeed, while housed in these homes, these children were fed, they were clothed, they did have more beds, they were being schooled, they were being taught trades, and they were surrounded by hundreds of children like themselves, things which many of these children, who had already suffered enough in their lives, lost when sent to Canada. There were also many voices of concern in the United Kingdom about the terms in which these children were sent out under. William Skivington from Manchester, in efforts to reverse these policies, stated in 1907 that these children were sent out to work in Canada at an age and under conditions which would not be tolerated in England, that these children were not adopted but used for work in Canada because child labour was allowed here, that they had seven applicants for every child sent and that for children from seven years of age, the conditions were forced labor, and that this system was robbing them of their childhoods and the opportunity of a sound education. Mr. Skivington also stated that the immigration of these young children for working purposes savored of trafficking in child labor between the agencies in England and the agencies in Canada. Speaking at a meeting of the Manchester Guardians in 1910, Catherine Garrett had said, we are not fighting particular cases, but the general principle of sending out children to another country to live and to be employed there under conditions which were illegal in their own land. In these words, we have real contemporary rebuttals of the policy of sending countless thousands of young people to an uncertain future in a faraway country. What is important to note here is that even in those days, there were people who were uncomfortable with this policy and had the evidence to cast doubt on the optimistic view that they were sending young people to a better life. Following the Doyle report, it took 50 years before voices of concern for these children were raised in this country, and then it was still only a very few. In fact, it took 65 years for Canada to call a halt to these migrant schemes, which lasted 76 years in total. All those years, the main concern of our government, medical community, and our very own citizens was not for the well-being of these children, 
but the fear that these children were infecting our country with their defective genes and their diseases. In all the papers, policies, and literature of the time, it is difficult to find in Canada any evidence of any concern for the psychological well-being of these children. Children who were suffering from a life of rejection and emotional deprivation. Children who were too small, weak, young, inept, or unwilling to do the work that was being demanded of them. Children who spent their childhoods being sent from one farm to the next. In our very own House of Commons, these children were referred to as nearly all disease savages. In a meeting of the Select Standing Committee in 1894, Dr. MacDonald, the member for East Huron, had said, These children are dumped on Canadian soil who, in my opinion, should not be allowed to come here at all. It is just the same as if garbage was thrown into your backyard and allowed to remain there. Dr. C.K. Clark, the father of Canadian psychology, the then Dean of Psychology at the Queen's University in Kingston, and for whom the Clark Institute in Toronto was named, despised the home children. His campaign against them was relentless. In a lecture to his students, he had said, In Canada, we are deliberately adding to our population hundreds of children bearing all the stigmata of physical and mental degeneracy. The next generation must be considered, but the harvest has already commenced. A juvenile criminal here, an insane person there. The Honourable Frederick Nichols from Toronto, Ontario, was a member of our Canadian Parliament, serving on the Standing Committee on Immigration and Labour. He also served on the General Council of the Canadian Patriotic Fund and the Executive Committee of the Toronto Branch of the Canadian Red Cross Society. Mr. Nichols was also the second Vice President of the Canadian General Electric Company and he was a highly regarded spokesperson for the manufacturing and hydroelectric industries here in Canada. Mr. Nichols was also the Vice President of the Toronto Press Club and creator and publisher of the Canadian Manufacturer and Industrial World magazine, the official magazine for the Canadian Manufacturers Association. Among many articles written about the home children in his magazine, one lengthy article published in his April 1891 edition entitled Undesirable Immigrants stated, These wastes and strays are tainted and corrupt with moral slime and filth inherited from parents and surroundings of the most foul and disgusting character, and all the washing and clean clothes that Dr. Bernardo may bestow cannot possibly remove. There is no power whatsoever that can cleanse the leopards so as to fit them to become desirable citizens of Canada. Further, it was stated that Dr. Bernardo was doing a great wrong in dumping his human warts upon Canada. With powerful people in this country saying such things about innocent children, is it really any wonder that the citizens of this country then adopted the attitudes they did in regards to these children? In my opinion, this was the cause of the abuse which rained down on so many of their precious heads. Conversely, there was a report of the Canadian Department of Immigration and Colonization in 1925 which stated, the great majority of children are of poor but respectable people who by reasons of business reverses and other misfortunes have become dependent upon the charity of the public and the state. This report further states that the consent of the parent or guardian had been a formidable obstacle to the migration of many splendid boys and girls. There was recognition in our government that these children were not swept from the gutter but from families who are victims of circumstances and that the parents of the children did not want them sent to Canada. Yet despite the wishes of many parents, they allowed this migration of children to continue for another 24 years after this report. The children's cries for help went unheard for a total of 86 years in Canada. Tragically, this took its toll on many of these precious lives. George Carter is a hundred years old. My father was killed at the coal mine at Scotia and then Thomas at the coal mine in England in 1904. And I lived with my father, sister, my aunt, till I was ten. It wasn't long before George was sent to a farm in Canada. They used me as a slave from the beginning I came to the world I left. I was lost. I was afraid. Uh, you know, I was very nervous. He had me up falling in the hay, building the logs. There was no uh, hay 
They kept infected with iron. The stigmatization these children suffered in Canada caused most to remain silent their entire lives about being a home child. The shame so deeply ingrained in their souls that even telling their close family members was unbearable. Sadly, this negative stigmatization, which began in the early years of these migrant programs, stuck throughout the years. Cyril Hewitt is the surviving Bernardo child who came to Canada in 1938. 75 years after this program began. In an interview this past November, this is what he says about the stigmatization suffered by the children here in Canada. It is heartbreaking. Now, the farm I work for, or was put in, in, in Pichero, whenever company arrived, I was told, make yourself scarce. You're just a home boy who don't want you around when we've got company in the house. You're a homeboy. You're a nobody. You're here to work. I refer to in lots of instances as a street rat, gutter rat, little thieves. That's what we refer to it as. We want to be trusted. That's the main time we got on you. And uh, that was hard to get over. To, to, to win the trust of the people you're with and uh, the people around you to show that you, you weren't one of those fellows you could be trusted with a decent time. Most of the home children, alone and separated from others, reacted to their fate in the same way, by withdrawing into themselves and remaining silent about their past, building a wall around themselves, as one homegirl put it. Their silence is bitter and conclusive proof of the severity of their trauma, it is also sad evidence that the child migration scheme, however well intended, was seriously flawed. Sadly, this negative stigmatization, which began in the early years of these migration programs, which to this day has not been lifted, stuck throughout the years. There are many Canadians who still believe this negative stigmatization of these children. In an email sent to me recently, the author writes, History is full of huge injustices, of which the plight of the home children is at the bottom of the scale. It was to the great advantage of most of these children to be swept off the sordid streets of British cities and given a fighting chance to make something of themselves in Canada. Stop wasting people's time on self-centered protests and non-issues such as this. Sadly today, this negative stigmatization is still being fostered by our Canadian press. In August of last year, the Toronto Sun published an article written by reporter Don Peet entitled Ford Roots Revealed. Mr. Peet was taking a swipe at Toronto Mayor Rob Ford's unruly behavior as being a genetic defect passed down by his British home child grandfather, a man who would in fact become a decorated war veteran. I shudder to think that any of our surviving home children may have read this, many still suffering the sting of society's rejection of them and many whom, like 104-year-old Walter Golding, the unfounded shame we still feel today reduces them to tears, as we heard. This is why we need to talk about these children, why we need to talk about their good stories, but we also need to talk about the bad. The dark stigma imposed on home children, however cruel and unjust, can be eliminated today by simply exposing it to the bright light of truth by telling the home children's story as it really happened. This is something which descendants have been trying to do for years, but it's a shame which still surrounds these children. It is time our government step up and issue its long overdue apology so that our country will know about these children, just as we now all know about the native children in the residential schools. So that Canada will know who these children really were, sad, frightened, lonely children, taken from their homes, families, and countries for whatever reason, because it really doesn't matter why they came. What matters is what we did as a nation to these children. An apology will help heal open wounds and will acknowledge the wrong done to these children, setting the record straight once and for all, and finally, nationally, lifting the silent cloak of shame which has surrounded these children for 150 years now finally ending their silence, a silence which many took to the grave, 
a silence which many home children to this day bear. While it is true that many were treated well, home children were generally denied affection because they were just hired hands. Home children were separated from country, culture, family, and friends. They were effectively cut out of wills, denied photographs, family mementos, medical histories, and legal papers such as birth certificates. Some were sent to homes where no English was spoken. Few got the schooling promised, and many were even denied the pittance they were to receive for their labor. Dave Morante of Home Children Canada, a man who has spent years researching our home children, a man who has interviewed many home children himself, estimates that two-thirds of these children were abused. What they needed was love, care, and tender hearts. And what most of them got instead was exploited, abused, and used for cheap labor 86 years of it. Canada was built on the backs of these tender children, and this needs to be nationally acknowledged, and it needs to never, ever be forgotten. Today, the Government of Australia will move the following motion of apology in the Parliament of Australia. We come together today to deal with an ugly chapter in our nation's history. And we come together today to offer our nation's apology. To say to you, the forgotten Australians, and those who were sent to our shores as children without their consent, that we are sorry. Sorry that as children you were taken from your families and placed in institutions where so often you were abused. Sorry for the physical suffering, the emotional starvation, and the cold absence of love, of tenderness, of care. Sorry for the tragedy, the absolute tragedy, of childhoods lost. Childhoods spent instead in austere and authoritarian places where names were replaced by numbers. Spontaneous play by regimented routine. The joy of learning by the repetitive drudgery of menial work. Sorry for all these injustices to you as children who were placed in our care. As a nation, we must now reflect on those who did not receive proper care. We look back with shame that so many of you were left cold, hungry, and alone, and with nowhere to hide, and nobody, absolutely nobody, to whom to turn. We look back with shame that many of these little ones who were entrusted to institutions and foster homes instead were abused physically, humiliated cruelly, violated sexually. And we look back with shame at how those with power were allowed to abuse those who had none. And how then, as if this was not injury enough, you were left ill-prepared for life outside, left to fend for yourselves, often unable to read or write, to struggle alone with no friends and no family. For these failures to offer proper care to the powerless, the voiceless, and the most vulnerable, we say sorry. We reflect too today on the families who were ripped apart simply because they had fallen on hard times. Hard times brought about by illness, by death and by poverty. Some simply left destitute when fathers damaged by war could no longer cope. Again, we say sorry for the extended families you never knew. We acknowledge the particular pain of children shipped to Australia as child migrants. Robbed of your families, robbed of your homeland, regarded not as innocent children, but regarded instead as a source of child labour. To those of you who were told you were orphans, brought here without your parents' knowledge or consent, we acknowledge the lies you were told.
the lies told to your mothers and fathers, and the pain that these lives have caused for a lifetime. To those of you separated on the dockside from your brothers and sisters, taken alone and unprotected to the most remote parts of a foreign land, we acknowledge today that the laws of our nation failed you. And for this, we are deeply sorry. We think also today of all the families of these forgotten Australians and former child migrants who are still grieving, families who were never reunited, families who were never reconciled, families who were lost to one another forever. We reflect too on the burden that is still carried by our own children, your own children, your grandchildren, your husbands, your wives, your partners and your friends. And we thank them for the faith, the love and the depth of commitment that has helped see you through the valley of tears that was not of your own making. And we reflect with you as well in sad remembrance on those who simply could not cope and who took their own lives in absolute despair. 